Hello, everyone. Welcome back for yet another episode of uh, our audio and video podcast series titled COVID-19 State of Exception, SOE, launched by the School of Law of the University of Nicosia to deal with uh, certain aspects of the current planetary pandemic crisis. Uh, today, I'm super excited because we are featuring, we are hosting Dr. Dina Chuvala, a senior research fellow at the ARC Laureate Program in International Law at the University of Melbourne and a founding member of the editorial collective of the recently launched Third World Approaches to International Law Review, Trail Review. Dr. Juvala has previously worked as a lecturer at Durham Law School, where she also completed her PhD thesis entitled Letters of Blood and Fire, a Socioeconomic History of International Law. Her research places particular emphasis on history, theory, and the political economy of international law. We're going to discuss certain aspects of the international legal construct based on uh, two exegesis. So we have an expert here today among us, a Greek scholar uh, making an academic career in uh, the far land of Australia. We're going to discuss uh, uh, about the current situation and the preventive measures adopted by the Australian authorities as uh, in, a, in the form of an intro to our today's podcast. So without further ado, Dr. Juvala, Dina, if I may, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, to begin with. Thank you so much for the invitation uh, and the University of Nicosia for hosting this podcast. It's just incredible what you guys are doing, especially under these tough circumstances. And I think it's great to already start thinking a bit um, more theoretically and more academically about the things that are happening around us because it's just so easy to get overwhelmed, um, you know? So yeah, um, um, as you said, I'm based in Australia for uh, now and Australia shut down approximately uh, four to five weeks ago. So we are, Australia is a federal state, so there is a degree um, of difference uh, of different measures between the different states, but basically we are in a very soft lockdown. So we you're, we are only allowed to go out for particular reasons, but there is no restriction as to the number of times one can go out. Nor does one need um, some sort of uh, paperwork in advance. Uh, so in that sense, things are still a bit more relaxed than they are in Cyprus and Greece, as far as I know, in much of Europe. But also, I mean, let me remind to anyone who's uh, watching that, of course, we're just spring. Uh, we uh, it's it's autumn here, right? Mm. So we're still at the end of summer so nobody knows what's going to happen between june and august which is when winter well not that properly strikes but it's kind of a winter in australia uh and um the government uh even though it's a conservative government uh it, they realized for example quickly that job losses were going to be huge especially in things like the hospitality sector so they doubled the job seekers allowance which was which has been uh, there has been pressures to do that for a very long time and this is in a sense for now an acknowledgement that the job seekers allowance was not uh, nearly enough for people to survive and there has been um, measures uh, to support self-employed people and so on uh, what is of interest perhaps to people who are uh, listening is that so far at least it seems that um, higher education has not received nearly enough money um, given its huge losses uh, during the last couple of months. Australian universities um, to varying degrees but they do depend a lot on uh, international students, especially students from China and Southeast Asia and of course the registration numbers have collapsed, justifiably so. So there is a big worry amongst the academic community here um, that uh, there will be huge job losses in higher education unless the government really steps up um, its support uh, of universities, which amongst other reasons would also be good financially because higher education in Australia is a, is a huge employer and a huge industry for country right 
Um, so yeah, this is the situation. Of course, things are quite uncertain. So far, Australia is also a country um, that did not enter a recession in 2008, 2009. Oh, yeah. So like a recession, I think, would be a pretty traumatic event for Australia, at least because they have kind of forgotten <laughs> what a recession looks like. Uh, but for now, we are all um, kind of sitting ducks, spending most time in the house and to the extent um, that there are legal questions and problems about the measures, they especially involve uh, very extensive police discretion okay. about enforcement. Uh, yes, yeah, so the laws have been drafted giving police very wide discretion about how and when to find people. So for example, just to give you a sense of the concerns in in sydney it's mostly the eastern suburbs that had had um huge numbers of the outbreaks the eastern suburbs are more affluent suburbs of sydney oh, okay but fines are mostly confined in the western suburbs of sydney that have actually they have barely any cases but they are disproportionately the places where people of color and poorer people live in Sydney. So this is a point of concern for lawyers, but also, for, of course, for citizens and people who live here, which is um, the laws are quite vague and they're being enforced quite selectively. And actually, the selectivity has nothing to do with medical mm necessity or rationality so that's a point where civil society and civil rights lawyers are like are starting yeah and they will it seems that they will be sooner or later cases going through the courts so like law, civil rights lawyers have already announced challenges um to some of these fines because in certain cases it can be a few thousand dollars which especially given the socioeconomic geography yeah. of the fines, that can be quite an issue. So that's, that's our current situation. Well, thank you, Gina, for, for this intro. It's uh, really something learning uh, what the state of exception looks like in uh, a distant land in Australia. Here in Cyprus, things are a bit different, but uh, as, you can, or as you have also pointed out, the socioeconomic geography of uh, the preventive measures is a factor of paramount importance vis-a-vis -vis how governmental and administrative authorities are handling the situation, the crisis, uh, either in Europe, in Oceania, or the Americas. Let us now turn to your own field of expertise. Recently, you've contributed to the online COVID-19 International Law Symposium, hosted by the renowned, the well-known international legal blog named Opinion Juris. Your contribution bears the title The Combined and Uneven Geography of COVID-19 or on Law, Capitalism and Disease. And it poses to the epicenter of the current debate, more or less, the basic coordinates of the trail discourse, the third world approaches to international law discourse. Do you care to share your initial thoughts with our subscribers, with our viewers? What made you analyze the ongoing planetary health crisis under the lens of critical international law and the trail scholarship? Sure. Yeah, to begin with, uh, I need to give a huge shout out to the organizers of the symposium. And yeah, it's really encourage uh, your uh, viewers to go and read it. It has a huge number of contributions that deal with the outbreak, both from a doctrinal and a theoretical historical perspective. So there is something there for every uh, taste. Um, so what has been really nagging me uh, about the way many people talk about the outbreak is this moral panic that the problem is that Chinese people are eating weird stuff and they have wet markets and that's um, the problem and that's why they're supposedly responsible for what is happening now. And of course, part of the reason this bothers me, of course, is that it is clearly racist, but it also bothers me because I think it misses 
what is really distinctive about this outbreak and other outbreaks before it, but especially COVID-19. And what, what I think is really distinctive is that it is actually China's modernity and especially China's rapid economic growth uh, and rapid transition to capitalism the last 30 years that is responsible both for the outbreak and for how quickly it spread around the world. So in case your viewers um, don't know, the concern is, and that is a concern that had been um, expressed by radical biologists long ago, a concern yeah. is that as um, we are cutting down forests more and more and we are pushing communities further into forests that previously were den dense and uninhabited, we come to contact with viruses that we have not come before, with viruses that um, had as it, their habitat wild animals in um, very dense forests. And therefore, it's much more likely that some of these viruses will jump to humans and then from human to human. So in a sense, and Wuhan and Hubei more generally has been one of the centers uh, of Chinese development the last few years. So approximately, I think 10% of car production in China is actually happening in Hubei. So oh, yeah. it's a very quickly uh, developed um, era. And, and for many decades, China was being praised for lifting billions of people out of poverty. But the flip side of that has been um, a very rapid intrusion into ecosystems in ways that, as it turns out, we can't understand exactly or predict the consequences. And the second aspect, of course, is that China is now profoundly integrated in, uh, uh, in global value chains, in international capitalism, and it means that if a disease starts there, it's impossible to be contained. Chinese yeah. people, goods, capital, like they move around the world all the time and Western and others go to China all the time. Um, and therefore what I wanted to flag uh, with this intervention that you mentioned was how it is Chinese modernity and development, not backwardness, that is at the very heart um, of this outbreak and therefore how we can start thinking also about um, the international laws that have underpinned this Chinese the Chinese entrance into globalization, for example, the 2001 Chinese accession to the WTO, to the World Trade Organization. Uh, and we can start thinking to what extent this um, globalization is uneven. Not everybody can move as freely. And to what extent our international laws and institutions have contributed to an uneven geography um, that is now making the disease spread or exacerbating its um, negative consequences. So that was basically the core of my concern and the core of my argument. Okay, thank you, Dina. This is really important. This is really interesting, given the fact that trail approach, especially in Europe, even in uh, a European country like Cyprus with the post-colonial and the colonial past, uh, the trail approaches or so the, the so-called non-strictly positivistic approaches uh, uh, seldom do reach uh, great audiences, expanded audiences, or even... Uh, student auditoriums, class auditoriums. Anyway, moving now to my next question. You, as we pointed out, you belong to the new generation of the promising international legal scholarship, fostering contextual analysis of the international legal construct beyond the formalism of the so-called classical, traditional, positivistic, etc. doctrine. What lessons can we learn from incorporating the trail approach to the contemporary debate? about international institutions, either regional and or universal, and cooperation towards overcoming this existential crisis of the international system, this pandemic, this planetary pandemic crisis. 
So, yeah, I mean, as you said really well, Trail is both a loose grouping of academics and, let's say, the sensibility in the way we approach international law. And the last three decades or so has been gaining um, popularity, admittedly mostly to English-speaking context, and that's a limitation that we need, all of us need to address. And yeah, if your readers want to check out the work of people like B.S. Chimney, Sandia Pahuja, Anthony Angi, Karen Mickelson, um, they have tremendous resources in my mind for this moment. And I think there are two impulses that Twail has that can be really useful, even for people who might not be Twailers, but it's really useful for this moment. I think the first is the impulse to historicize and the impulse to always resist claims that something is entirely new and original. And Obio Kafour, for example, right after 9-11, he wrote a beautiful article and he, he said, well, this might be new for the US, but it's non-state actors and terrorist attacks are not new in the failed world, nor are the militarized responses of the United States. So I think a first point here would be that to resist a bit the idea of the newness, which doesn't mean that, of course, everything is the same, but it means that infectious diseases historically have been ways um, of ex extending executive power, and they have um, been ways very often of um, demonizing and further marginalizing already uh, marginalized populations, and especially bodies of color, treating bodies of color as somehow inherently diseased and inherently dangerous. And the international legal order has been occasionally part of that. So that would be one thing to resist the newness and trying to find in the history of our own discipline and our own institutions uh, in this in which we've dealt with infectious diseases and how we did so and I would say it hasn't always been particularly great and one way we could think about it would be the way international laws especially regarding intellectual property, really slowed down, for example, the distribution of HIV AIDS medication in the developed uh, world by making um, prices really, really high and start thinking, for example, to what extent these laws uh, can hinder research and dissemination of research when it comes to essential drugs. So that would be one, right? Resisting claims of newness, looking to history. And the other things I would say would be, I don't know if my fellow dwellers would use this phrase, but like a hermeneutics of suspicion. So that's that's a phrase that has been used to describe the, wor the work of um, Nietzsche, Mark, and Freud. Basically an idea that even behind nominally very neutral and positivist and doctrinal texts, there is always a second reading. One doesn't need to be a conspiracy theorist to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> but the idea that, and especially the idea that we can read our texts with a very keen eye for power, for colonial relations, for exploitative relations that are being constructed and facilitated through these texts. So of course, doctrinal analysis and positivistic analysis can always be the first step, um, but the idea, the idea is that there is more to that. There is more to what the law explicitly says and the, what is there is what the law says indirectly and what the law does besides and beyond its very nice pronouncement. <laughs> so I would say that's what Tuail can bring to this discussion, especially as we see now invocations of the public good, of public health and things like that, which is a good thing, the return of the language of public good in my mind. But we should be really careful to see what sort of laws and practices it authorizes. And I think the work of Twailers um, 
is is a very important uh, inspiration there. Oh yeah. Certainly. Thank you, Dina, for sharing with us these basic coordinates, all these basic uh, characteristics that contribute to an alternative to a like analysis of the current crisis. It's important to point out that in the post-9-11 international arena, international law and international institution, institutions sorry, have faced different challenges stemming from the desire of major powers, either regionally or universally, to claim for themselves a more expansive interpretation of the positivistic uh, doctrine of international law, and especially the doctrine vis-a-vis uh, -vis the use of force. Do you think that the current health crisis poses yet another kind of challenge for the juridical edifice of international law? What about the obvious, at least from my point of view, danger of a recurring unilateralism coupled with a parochial revitalization of the nation state as the solid block of international institutions? Yes, yeah, so I, I'm actually, I think there is a huge danger there and I think the danger starts with rhetoric and the rhetoric of war as uh, the most, supposedly the most appropriate rhetoric to deal with COVID-19. Um, and there is already amazing work out there, including uh, Catherine Connolly from Ireland, who is writing about that. And my concern is that um, after 9-11, we learned to deal with global challenges through one way, principally, and that way is securitization and militarization, and that there is a distinct danger of using these same tools for dealing um, with the current situation. And these dangers far exceed the dangers, for example, in China, right? Because usually the concern there is that this is a problem only for authoritarian states such as China and the West is somehow immune to this approach but at the same time we see the language um, of war and force and invisible enemies being used to describe what is a virus that doesn't have a conscious or bad intentions or good intentions towards us is just a virus um, and what worries me is that their precedence in towards that direction in international law. So during the previous Ebola outbreak, the Security Council with a resolution 2177 actually designated the Ebola outbreak as a threat to the peace. So for those of um, your listeners who might not know, this is an essential determination under Article 39 of the Charter of the United Nations that can, it's a gateway article that can lead to the authorization of a number um, of measures, but these measures can include the use of force. No force was used back in 2014, thank God, but this idea that it's actually plausible and possible to link infectious diseases with the use of force. It's out there and it has been circulating not only in policy circles, but also in international legal doctrine. So I think it is extremely important, as you said, to um, be concerned about unilateralism, but also in a sense against multilateralism that because we can see that also the UN uh, has adopted a, an approach that s can snowball towards a very heavily um, securitized and militarized response to the current situation. And I'm not saying that this will happen, but especially in a context of geopolitical tension between China and the United States, I think we should be extra careful about the deployment of this sort of language, especially in legal circles. Uh, yeah, it is really understandable. Uh, we can see we're facing a challenging and interesting era. The Security Council of the United Nations has not been seized, at least in my knowledge, with the current situation, but as you rightly, po correctly pointed out, we have the Ebola president also. We should point out that uh, the United Nations peacekeeping operation in Haiti bears or 
supposedly bears responsibility for yet another pandemic, for yet another crisis in this particular edge of the world. And it's important to understand that the, the, in the current edifice, in the contemporary edifice of international legal organization, we have more or less uh, endorsed the principle of uh, non-viable responsibility for international organizations. We have certain uh, judicial precedents even vis-a-vis uh, -vis the NATO operations or the, the military operations back in Srebrenica, the jurisdiction, the jurisprudence, sorry, about the mothers of Srebrenica uh, before the Dutch uh, Supreme Court. It's, uh, should be pointed out. So a brief comment about, let's say, the international responsibility of organizations for not dealing with the crisis would be nice for from a trailer or a critical international legal scholar approach, of well, course. And there is, so there is the work, again, the context of Ebola, but Marty Guy Serleif has been writing exactly on that. And I think it's really interesting, especially because there is discussions going around about the possible responsibility of China, but there is far less discussion, for example, about the possible responsibility of the World Bank or the IMF for having had a very profoundly negative impact on the public health systems of a number of countries, both in the European South and in the global South. So as you say, um, and I think discussions about responsibility be legal or political or moral responsibility tend to focus on particular actors but not on international actors very often and i think especially um after this crisis there and there has been very constructive um doctrinal suggestions by Twail scholars such as Mountain Guy about how to think about the um, rules of international responsibility in a way that is better suited for understanding the spread of infectious uh, diseases because this is not how these principles have been drafted but it seems right now that our approach is a very particularly state-centric approach that imagines responsibility for incidents instead of responsibility for structural inadequacies that might have led to, to making the situation worse at the very least. If not the outbreak, at the very least of making the situation worse. Okay, it's really understandable how this, uh, the doctrine, for instance, of the positive obligations of the state might, may be employed in order to deal with the current crisis, of course, it should be pointed out that uh, social rights, uh, like more or less anything else other than individual rights and uh, political rights, are under a constant state of attack, both in Greece, yeah. in Cyprus, and in the global south. And more or less, we should actually start to discuss about the structural obligations and the structural indicators, as you greatly, greatly and uh, timely pointed out. Because we are in a position of nowadays being able to understand, to let's say measure and uh, uh, to fathom uh, the consequences of uh, the economic crisis and the policy of austerity adapted in the global south. So yeah, for instance, this uh, self-imposed or government-imposed quarantine and the lockdown we're facing is actually a consequence of the inability of the social health system to deal with the crisis, to deal with the numbers of the crisis. It's not just a preventive measure, measure. it's an emergency, a necessity, because of the impossibility of uh, trying, let's say, uh, to treat uh, 1,000 cases at the same time. So yeah, thank you, Dina, for this. It was really, really important to point, it out, to point out, even in the context of international legal debate. Moving now to yet another question for you. Certain scholars and commentators have pointed out the danger of racializing international responsibility. You've also uh, pressed this matter for the spread of the pandemic. Furthermore, questions of gender, identity, and uh, vulnerability are seemingly left aside when central policies are being drafted and implemented either nationally or internationally. What could be Taylor's analysis vis-a-vis -vis these threats and challenges, and especially the vulnerability versus uh, or dash identity 
uh, aspect of the crisis. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think especially in this context, the racial aspect has been basically impossible to me. I think one aspect that it's really interesting, and there has been 12 work uh, on that issue, is, for example, how our legal doctrines uh, on emergencies, since that's also the title of your podcasts, are deeply racialized. And there is, for example, fantastic work by John Reynolds, who has shown really persuasively how the core doctrine uh, of the European Court of Human Rights about emergencies was basically shaped by colonial emergencies uh, that Britain declared, interestingly, in Kenya, but also in Cyprus, right? So the idea that um, the enemy is inherently rational, is um, ultra-violent, and normal legal measures cannot possibly uh, contribute to uh, restoring of order and so on and so forth. So uh, keeping always an eye on states of emergency, legal states of emergency, because at a very... Uh, core positivist level these these rules have been formed by empire by empire emergent imperial emergency and by racialization of imperial subjects so that would be the first one and the second as you said and there has been already some really good feminist legal work on that is of course COVID-19 and the lockdown as an emergency of care right so like the care work that previously we um outsourced to teachers nurses nursery homes whatever has now been brought back home and of course this has a disproportionate effect to those who do care work which is women and especially women of color um, so yeah, one could hope that both during the crisis and after, this would lead to a re-evaluation of just how important care work is, both inside and outside the home. And international law is not particularly good at that. National laws are not either, but that's not my expertise. But for example, international law is much more concerned about things like economic growth, GDP, things yeah. that can be readily measured. And productive work is considered to be work that contributes to things like that. Whereas care work, which now turns out to be paramount, um, uh, is not properly valued by our international legal laws, by our international laws and international um, institutions. So I think that would be, uh, if anything, a crucial lesson from COVID-19. And I think the other, the second bit which is related is that both national and international legal orders have been consistently worried about some human mobilities. So people from the global south, terrorists, foreign fighters or whatever. But it turns out during this crisis that it's not these bodies that turn out to be the ones that spread the disease. It turned out to be affluent citizens of the global north and their abilities, our abilities um, to cross borders quite easily that have been contributed um, to this disease. And of course, this could lead to the conclusion to say, oh, let's make borders more difficult to cross for everyone. That's not what I mean. Uh, but I do think the international legal and domestic orders should very seriously re-examine um, our obsession with, with constraining particular bodies mm. while enabling other bodies to move freely because it did turn out that our prioritizations were deeply uh, skewed and also deeply racialized and gendered and so on. So I think this can be just some aspect and there is, yeah, there is already the anthropologists are doing incredible work at bringing out what you just said, these identity um, issues and trying both to better understand the situation, but to also make sure that the responses are not unjust and unfair towards those who are already 
um, oppressed and marginalized. So ultimately the current crisis is uh, more or less a revival of the Foucauldian debate about biopolitics or the post-Foucauldian debate about necropolitics, the power of the international order or the power of a state uh, to mandate and degree vis-a-vis -vis the corporal and non-corporal corporal bodies, so the body politic, our individual, our individual bodies and more or less the political community. It's really important to point out that notions of international solidarity or uh, responsibility to protect have remained outside the, or at the sidelines of the current uh, legal and political debate vis-a-vis -vis handling and dealing with the current crisis. Uh, would you care to share a few comments, a brief comment, that as we are merely finishing our podcast now, uh, with our viewers about how solidarity and responsibility may be interpreted under a Taylor lens. Absolutely. So I think actually this is an, a very good point in the sense that I think the current situation points at the limits of, the, of these doctrines, right? And especially, for example, the fact that responsibility to protect has been developed mostly around I, ideas about permissiveness of use of force rather than actual responsibility for structural injustice or um, ways of uh, alleviating uh, suffering caused by structural injustice. So in my mind, that would be um, the twill inside here, um, an idea that, and also the twill inside would be particularly important about solidarity in bringing out the fundamental interconnectedness of the international because in the aftermath of decolonization um, post-colonial states have often been blamed for their own social problems whereas I think now it becomes particularly evident how integrated we all are, but we are integrated in profoundly unequal ways. So I think solidarity in that context, according to a Twail reading, would become the necessary um, political expression of our economic and social interdependence rather than charity or goodwill or whatever. Um, because, yeah, I think the idea that like individual states can be blamed um, for their problems and especially individual states that have these colonial legacies, is just turning out to be laughable. Uh, and the second thing, as you said, I think, and as you said earlier, I think to ail at the current conjuncture would be a good guide for, on the one hand, resisting the resurgence on unilateralism and nationalism, but on the other hand, cautioning against the idea that all things international are necessarily good and solidaristic and noble or non-nationalist. So I think that would be, like, it would also be an idea of not trusting discourses of solidarity by default, but seeing what they're being used to authorize in international law. It's really interesting, actually, that we are now trying to deal with uh, both the structural and uh, the individual, the particular problems or aspects of this planetary crisis. But we tend to forget that the pandemic crisis was also... Uh, let's say the footprint was also considered a colonial footprint or a, col a consequence of the relationships between the center and the peripheries between the colonial master and the oppressed because more or less uh, uh, the what is now being considered the global south was also a laboratory for testing uh, or even for blaming uh, the, for the spread of diseases back in the colonial era before the decolonization movement uh, was effectuated. So please let me to co conclude with your brief uh, 
comments, with your brief remarks vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between the center and the peripheries, because uh, some uh, scientists have suggest and politicians have also suggested trying uh, um, vaccines uh, for COVID to uh, third world or uh, developing countries in Africa and this whole, let's say, parlance uh, about the center and peripheries is also reviving. It, it's present because empire moves. It's constantly present. But we are now turning to a post, uh, to a pre, sorry, decolonization parlance re rhetoric between center and peripheries, describing the relationship between center and peripheries. So your brief remarks. Absolutely, and there are also uh, initiatives in the United States to test also vaccines in um, African-American majority hospitals and neighborhoods. And that's also another aspect, right, that this experimentation was happening in the Global South, but it was also happening um, against people of color in the metropolis, right? So, and I think that's also part of the sensitivity that especially newer approaches to trail is trying to bring in, and especially to make us think more inclusively when we are thinking about the distinctions and oppression that international law effectuates. So one of these distinctions, of course, is rich countries versus poor former colonial countries but i think also the experience of decolonization has so that this state centrism can lead to the creation of states mm -hmm. that are nominally independent but in reality not really or that they become authoritarian and so on and so forth so i think the twill sensibility in this context would also be to find the peripheries or to find the oppressed, rather, peripheries would be a metaphor here, to find the oppressed also within each and every state, and also not to necessarily believe the argument of the state that it's acting on the behalf of all its citizens. And that's a core aspect of international law, right? That the state consents and it binds the whole political community, but I feel to Wales starting from the third world and the inability of the third world state to deliver justice to its own people, as for example, Professor Chimney has shown, I think it also gives us the tool to think about our own political communities, even if they are in the global north, and um, the inability and unwillingness of the state to deliver justice or to deliver a just, um, response to COVID-19 in this context. And it gives us at least the analytical tools to understand how this happens. And of course, then each of us can um, effectuate a different political response to that. But I think it gives us really valuable intellectual tools to that direction. Ina, thank you. This was an interesting, a super interesting discussion. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing uh, your mind, your point of view, your expertise, and also uh, your reality in Australia with our viewers. And it's been both a joy and an honor uh, having to, uh, this discussion with you. Uh, we will, for sure, we will discuss again once the crisis uh, is over about uh, the legal construct we are and the legal doctrines we are both studying thank you thank you dr dina thank Jubala. you so much Dimitri. thank you that was i really enjoyed the discussion and i think as i said before i think it's a great initiative to be trying to think soberly in the middle of this madness <laughs> oh yeah well dear friends don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Unique School of Law, in order to get our latest news and updates. And also, don't forget to like this video and uh, follow this playlist, the playlist COVID-19, State of Exception. Dina, this was great. We will Thank you. talk again. Thank you. Absolutely. Take good care and solidarity. Bye. Bye. Stay